So Asian languages. Can somebody find for me where it is on this thing? That's partially a trick question. So Asian language, some of them are over here. This is the uh, Indo-European to Indian branch. So you have languages like Sanskrit, which eventually went to languages like Hindi and Bengali and other languages. But many of the other languages that are considered Asian are actually not on this chart because this is the Indo-European family. And so the Indo-European family basically covers things that are Europe and West because they kind of originated around probably uh, Turkey-ish area and then some of India and then went West and North as they kept going along like the boats of explorers as we were discovering. And so other languages like Chinese and Japanese you will find are noticeably missing from this entire chart because they have literally nothing to do with the Indo-European family. They were created over there like plants growing out of no other plants. Yes. Anyway, the Indic language branch. This is the stuff that you do see on this chart. That's right over here. And so that's this. You know we're going to talk about languages like Sanskrit, Hindi, Persian, Urdu, Punjabi, and Sinhalese. Uh, where is Sinhalese spoken? Sri Lanka. So it, it's related to all of the uh, other Indo-European languages. And it's a similar geographical area as another language called Tamil. Uh, it's just that Tamil actually has much less to do with the uh, Indic language branch uh, that was sort of different. It's called the uh, Dravidian language branch, but we'll talk about that. So, when you hear Sanskrit, what do you think about? A script. Yeah, a script. Yeah? Sanskrit, yeah. So this is a sort of arrangement of stuff right here. You have dance over there and over here. That's a musical instrument called the sarangi. And here is Ayurveda, it's a herbal medicine sort of deal. Uh, and so this is an outline of the pronunciation sound A in Sanskrit. And you will see that it's pretty simple, it's just the letter A. So the words might sound pretty confusing at the beginning, you'll see that it gets much more simple. So just take a look at a word like this, right? Swaraj. Well, it might sound completely weird. Let's look at the word soiree in French. How do you spell the word soiree? Yeah? Yes, good. So let's write that on board. Ow. Soiree. French. So this is French. S O I R E E. So that soiree has an S, but then the wa sound is an O I, right? And then it has an R, and then the A sound is an E E. You really don't have that much of a complication. And does anyone want to guess the reason for a relative simplicity? In these languages? Yeah? Kind of. So it's actually more has to do with the fact that, you know, these languages don't really write in English, right? In the Roman alphabet. And so what happened was when you had other people, usually Europeans, that went over to those places and got all these terms for things like dances and musical instruments and medicine they sort of made English words out of the sounds that they heard. And so the words that they made are going to be pretty straightforward because they just sounded it out, basically. So if you do the exact same thing, just backwards, then you can kind of figure out how to spell it. Take a word like this, right? Not to come. It's pretty much completely phonetic. You have an N, that's a Na, an A, that's an A, a T for a Ta, another A for an A, a K, and an A. So that's not to come. It's pretty straightforward. And you have words like ahimsa. Same thing. It's like him, a him, and then a sa, an s a. Fairly simple. And same thing with the e sound. So the e sound is just an i. So let's take a look at the word in the middle. Dahi, right? The official definition for dahi in the dictionary is the curd of soured curdled milk which is kind of a fancy way of saying yogurt. So dahi, it's pretty much yogurt, and it's just D-A-H-I. That's the sound you hear. Da, he, right? And so take another word on the right. So someone say that. Yeah, so the L, and then the A with the two dots over it, that's an ah sound. So it's lasi, 
and it's just L-A-S-S-I. Pretty much the only tricky part about that word is the S-S, and that's because, uh, for example, in Bengali you would say Lassi, so you kind of pronounce the S two times, so it's like Lassi. In English you don't really have that. And we'll see that uh, more in one of the next slides. I'll talk about that too. So we're like this one, right? Sometimes you have these weird consonant groupings, like M and R together. You usually wouldn't see that unless you're going for an MRI. But this word has MRI at the beginning of it. Mridanga, or Mridanga. But it's still not as complicated as it might sound. It's just an MRI for Mri, and then D-A-N-G-A for Danga. Same thing with Swadeshi. So, Swadeshi comes from uh, Sva, which means one's own, and Des, which means country in Sanskrit. And so, one's own country is the movement for national independence in India. It has to do with, say, the time of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And then you have words like Kundalini, the yogic life force helped to line the spine. And then, what's another thing you think of when you think about, like, India? Kind of, but also dance. And so, that's a dance on the right, that's Bharatanatya. So, another term for India is Bharat, and so that's the beginning. And the rest of it is Natya. So, Natya means dance or drama. And so, over here, you have another word that means Abhinaya, the expressive use of face or hands in a particular dance style. So, uh, Kadakali, did you guys see the word on a slide before? So, Kadakali was uh, this one at the right. See, it says Kadakali. And so, Abhinaya is the expressive use of face or hands in that particular dance style. And then, so the B sound is one thing that you usually see with a BH. And the reason for that is, just like we were talking about, you know, sounding it out, in these languages, a lot of the time, it's not just a B sound, it's a B sound. So, like this one, right? Bhagavat in American English, would normally be pronounced something like Bhagavat. So it's a harder B sound. And that is transliterated as a BH. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah? So when you have a word like Bhikshu, right? So in India, for example, you might hear this uh, pronounced as Bhikshu. But in American English, it's Bhikshu. It's a harder B sound. But it's still spelled B-H-I-K-S-H-U. Same thing with the D sound. So the B and the D are pretty similar. You can have like a B and a B, or a D and a D. But we don't have to worry about all the uh, script in English. It's just Roman letters. And so the D is pretty much always a DH, except for pretty much one word, and that's a booty here. Booty is special because, like you were saying, that word would be pronounced buddhi. And so just like a Buddha, with a DDH, Buddhi and Buddha are two related words. Unlike Bodhi, Bodhi has just one DH. And so, so do the rest of the words. You have Dharma, you have Samadhi, a state of deep concentration, a lot of words that have to do with things like, you know, meditation or Buddhism comes from Buddhi. And then, same thing with the TH sound over here. So the T is just T. And then the second ta is tricky in this word, because you have a th. So this is one of the 24 founding lines of Jain tradition. And so, dharma, right? Can you even think of any other words that sound similar but have nothing to do with this word? Let's go back to Greek. What does derm mean in Greek? Yes, awesome. That has nothing to do with this. I just thought it would be fun. Right, so. Good, you guys remember. That means it's working. So D E R M equals skin. Yeah. Uh, can you give me an example of a word that has derm? Derm. Yes, pachyderm. What does pachyderm mean? And dermatologist. So, do you guys remember what pachy means? Thick. Yes, thick. And so a pachyderm is an animal like an elephant that has thick skin. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So that's basically Sanskrit, right? And then Hindi, Persian, and Urdu are like words that, uh, languages that derived from Sanskrit. Some of these have influences from languages like Arabic, too. And so one of the noticeable things is like in Sanskrit, you don't really have the Z. 
But here, you have words like izar, where this is a voluminous outer garment of Muslim women. So you have a Z sound here, well, that you wouldn't normally see in other languages. So you don't try spelling that with an S, that's just a Z. But over here, words like this, right? The only tricky part about this one, padisha, is an H at the end. The rest of it is phonetic. You have a P, that's a pa, an A for an A, right? A DI for a D, and then sha, S H A, and then there's an H. Words like masala, right? You guys have seen that before? Yes, awesome. So masala is just ma. How do you spell ma? M. And then A. And then sala, that's an S A and L A. Yeah. Good. And then you have words like tana, right? So tana would be pronounced tana, except it's just tana in English. So that ha has a th, a n a. And then some words at the end. Sometimes you do see that h slipping in different places. Because this is pansigar, right? So, pansigar, how would you think it might have been pronounced originally? Kind of. So, more of like a pa sound instead of like a pa. It's, it's hard to say, especially in American English. But sometimes there's an H, and so you have like a PH instead of just a P. But it's not like a cigar that has a C. This is S, more phonetic. You don't have to do weird things like saying the S sound is a C. And have you guys seen a Darjeeling tea before? Yes. Yeah? That one was asked National B. Uh, but that was like 2006, I think. But Darjeeling, it's all very phonetic. So you have Dar, that's a D-A-R, right? And the J sound is almost always a J. And I'll talk about one of the notable exceptions. The notable exception is not here. I'm, I'm just saying, sorry. What I was trying to say is that the I sound is almost always I, with the exception of dingi. So it's I or EE. -E. You have words like uh, roti that just has an I. Have you guys seen roti before? It's basically tortilla. So originated in different places, called by different names, pretty much similar things. Uh, and then so Darjeeling and Kolbi both have EE. -E. Koftgari and roti both have I. The unique one is dinghy. That one has a Y. Because that one had more of an English influence uh, rather than the original like EE -E or I. And that's why that one was different. So a Koftgari, who wants to guess what this picture is trying to show? Yeah, basically. So it's a way of putting gold on steel and making designs out of it. And that's called Koftgari. So you have the K sound with a K, right? The E sound in this word is an I. And the rest of it is straightforward. You have coughed. So K-O-F-T. It's like the past tense of <coughs> cough, but not spelled weird, like English. So how would you spell the <coughs> cough? Yeah. So ooh, I forgot my mark. So that would be <coughs> C-O-U-G-H, right? So how do you spell cough in this? K-O-F, basically. And then here, if it was past tense, you would add an E-D, right? Here, the same sound, coughed, is just K-O-F-T. And then after that, you add a gari. That's the G-A-R-I. So kalgi, unlike coughed gari, has a C. And it's one of the exceptions for the ka is a K. Because this one has a C, and not many other words do. It's weird. It's like this uh, plume, like a jeweled plume that you can put on a turban. And then a putti is this piece of cloth that you can wrap around your legs. Uh, it has two T's, which makes it kind of cool. And then two E's, too. Any questions about these words? How many of these are new words that you haven't seen before? Yeah? Awesome. Let's take a look. Roti, right? Again, straightforward. R-O-T-I. It's like you start it out with rotating, R-O-T, and then just finish it off with an I. Because they're circles. Get it? And then you have Darjeeling, that's a T. Ooh. And then just like Sanskrit, how we said, you know, 
there are words like Bodhi, right? B O D H I. Same thing in Hindi, Urdu, and Persian. The does sound is pretty much a D H. So you have words like Duri. So a Duri is a thick cotton cloth or a carpet. The tricky part about this is the R R I E. So I've decided to be interesting and have the E sound as an I E after an R R. But the rest of it is just a dir. Same thing with these two. Jodhpur and Kurta. So, there's a letter combination that isn't colored in. Can you make the connection? What's common between these three words? You are, exactly. So, and how is it pronounced? Er, basically. So, Duri, Jodhpur, and Kurta both have an er set, and it's just spelled with a ur. So it's not like an er or an ir, it's just ur. So, Kurta, right? K, not a C. U R. And then the ta. How do you spell ta? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then over there, kadi or kader. So that's a rough cotton cloth, especially homespun cotton cloth. It's a KH at the beginning. Uh, unlike kurta, that just has a single K. And then after that, it's just adi, A D I. So a jodhpur, the pants don't look like normal pants, do they? No. Do you guys have an idea of what you might use these pants for? Horse riding. Yes. Good. So you use them for horse riding because they are very tight near the uh, ankles or the shins, so you don't kind of have floppy pants when you're on the horse. But then it's very fluffy around the entire hip area to allow you a wide range of movement so you don't get obstructed on a horse and feel like you're about to fall off. And sometimes they also have straps under the feet to hold your shoes on. Because you wouldn't want your shoes to go fly off, right? There you go. So, Jodhpur, right? D, D, H. And the rest of it is straightforward. P, U, R. And more interesting words from Hindi, Persian, and Urdu. So, have any of you guys had samosas before? Yeah? They're pretty good, right? Yes. So, samosa, it's pretty straightforward too. It's just an S, um, A M, and then osa, O S A. So, you don't have to do any weird stuff with this word. But, namda and namna are going back to the trend of having an H at the end. What was the other word that had an H at the end? So, let's just look at these two. Namda and Namda, right? What's the difference between these two words? Yeah, one has a D and one has an N. Ooh, ooh. And so, Namda is a soft cloth, a felt or sheepskin pad placed on the horseback. And you might wear that with a jodhpur. While a Namda is a thick felted rug of Persia and India. And so both of them have the A-H at the end. And then over here, we can look at some other different patterns. So, like I said, uh, Izar, right? How is Izar spelled? Yeah. But unlike that, is it is special, because it has two Zs. This is Hindi from Arabic, and this means personal dignity or respect. Is it? So you might hear this pronounced Izza with like an emphasized Z. And that's why they made it into two Zs. It's just that when it's pronounced in English, it's just a is it, just one Z sound. So it's, those are like things to remember about these words that make them kind of unique. And that's why they're good spelling words. So that's why they ask these words pretty often. This one is especially interesting because Chatri, right? What's weird about this one? Exactly. So the Chuck sound, you would usually just have a CH for the Chuck sound. But this one has two H's for a ch. And over here is woots. Woots has an oo sound. It's just an oo. Does anyone know what the picture is showing? This one. It's. Sorry. So this one is actually a lump of iron or steel. So Woot is a very old steel from one of the oldest processes of making iron and steel. And so, has anyone heard of the uh, Iron Pillar of Delhi? It's one of the uh, ancient, unofficial wonders of the world. 
Uh, it's made of a very old composition of steel that has uh, surprisingly lasted a very long amount of time without like rusting or falling apart. But Lutz is special because it's like a very old iron and they do like acid this. And at the beginning I heard someone say Mofussel, right? So Mofussel is right here, the provincial or rural districts of India, the countryside. And Mofussel is special because you have two S's and an I-L. So unlike over with like Kurta and Jodhpuri where you have an U-R, here in Mofussel you have an I-L and an F for the F sound, not like a uh, fancy one. And then the rest of it is straightforward, right? Yeah? Okay. Any other questions on this slide? No? You got these? Cool. So now, Sinhalese and Punjabi, kind of opposing sides of India, one's up and one's down. But you have, at the beginning, Bangra. Who's heard of this before? Maybe. It's a popular dance music, has a particular style. And spelled with a BH, so kind of like the BH of before. This is another BH. But you don't need the BH when you have a word like berry berry. Having an H there would just be redundant. This is um, repetitive, something that you see in uh, Hawaiian too. Bless you. Uh, and so this one is just B E R I, and then what all over again? E -R -I. Exactly. So B E R I, B E R I, berry berry. It's not like the Strawberry berry? Fun fact, strawberries aren't berries, technically speaking. But, uh, and then you have words like disava. Do you know another word that this kind of looks like? Cassava? Kind of. Uh, what about cassava? So, how do you spell cassava? So, C A S S A B A. It has very little to do with this one. Kasava is a food, right? It's like a plant. And then Disava is a district governor. So, very little to do with each other. They're just spelled sort of similarly. Both have an S S A V A. They don't come from similar languages either. But, this is fun to look at because two S's, like Mofasal, kind of. Uh, and then you have words like pencil. And we're going to talk about this one also later on where we go to uh, Tagalog. Uh, what country is Tagalog from? Yes. And so, uh, what's a noodle dish of the Philippines? It looks kind of like this one. Yes, pansit. So, this is pansit, not to be confused with pansit. This is a rite in Hinayana Buddhism, and pansit is a food. Not very much to do with together, unless, of course, you're taking a Buddhist rite and eating noodles simultaneously. Then you're eating pansit and... It, not eating pansit. Eating pansit and taking your pencil. Oh well. And you have Wesak, the Buddhist New Year festival. Uh, how would you spell the we sound? Yes, exactly. A W E. It's straightforward, right? What about the sock? S A K. Yeah. So you have Wesak, W E S A K. Any other tricky things on the side? Look, look. Look for tricky things. Yes? No? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Cool. Good, good observation. So, some of the Hindi and Persian words had BHs, right? And so Bhangra is Punjabi, unlike the rest of the words on the slide. These are all Sinhalese. So Bhangra has Patterns similar to other Indian Indian languages compared to Sinhalese. Yeah? Yes, it does. So the weird symbol right here, right? That is called an N with a diphthong. Uh, diphthong is a funny word that basically means the part that's hanging off. That's because it's not normal N, it's not bangra, it's bangra. So it's like the uh, ing sound that you have in like a gerund. What's a gerund? A word with an ing, right? So like running or swimming? So in an ing, uh, the ing, the sound that you hear over here, is usually an ing with the n coming over. So that is a weird symbol. It's kind of cool. And yes, I saw another hand first. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And it kind of does. So uh, the question was, when you have a primary stress on a letter like an S, does that lead towards more uh, of a chance of doubling the letter compared to a place where you didn't have the primary stress? And the answer is yes, kind of. So this word, right, disava, the primary stress that looks like an apostrophe is right behind the S, which means you put the main stress on the S. Hear that rhyme. But over here, in a word like Wesok, right, you don't have a primary stress on the S. In fact, you have a secondary stress or no stress at all. And so over there, you wouldn't double the S, whereas in Desava, you would. Same thing with Kasava, although it has nothing to do with the language. Am I confusing you or just pointing out fun words? Awesome. Let's move on. So, Asian. Now, the words that I talked about that have nothing to do with the slide that we saw that has the Indo-European language branch. Some of these uh, languages are Tamil, Turkish, Mongolian, Japanese, Chinese, and then Sinhalese all over again. So, let's get started. Tamil. Four cool words that are asked relatively commonly, uh, and not many more besides these. So, you're getting a secret clue in to Tamil words. Awesome. Uh, there's Karandam. What does this look like? A rock, awesome. Even more specifically, a mineral or a gemstone or a crystal. Yeah? Yeah, an uncut mineral. Yeah? I'm sorry? Yeah, a ge possibly a geode. And then also, uh, it's related to like ruby. So it's like, right, that is kind of like a ruby. So, corundo, you may have seen this if you're looking at like gemstones or minerals. It's pretty straightforward. It's a C, not a K. That's a double thing. Just look at kanji over here. Kanji is a porridge made out of rice. Here, you don't have the thing with the uh, J being a J. Here you have a G for the J. And then with a cheroot or a shirut, it's a CH. So you can have C, SH, or CH with an SH, right? So that's one of the cool spelling bee tricks that you can use. So. Uh, what I'd like to say is that if you have alternate pronunciations, right? What are alternate pronunciations? Different ways of saying words. Yeah, different ways of saying a word. Uh, if you have alternate pronunciations and you're confused about how the word is spelled, uh, come up with a spelling in your mind and check it if with both of the alternate pronunciations. If you can reasonably say the word with both of the pronunciations the way that you're thinking it's spelled, then that's probably a good idea. But if one of them horribly doesn't work at all with the spelling that you thought of, then it's probably not the right spelling. So for example, if you heard cheroot, right? The pronouncer said cheroot. Uh, quick question. How many of you have done or have wanted to do a spelling bee before? Awesome, that's almost all of you. So, what are you going to do on the last day? Spelling Yes, come attend so you can do the spelling bee. No one gets out. Everyone stays in all the time. And if you spell the word correctly, you get a point. And everyone gets certificates, and the winners get prizes. Awesome. Okay, fine. Back to spelling. So, cheroot, right? And if you heard cheroot and thought it would be like an SH, right? Then you say, good question to ask. Can I have an alternate pronunciation, please? And the pronouncer says, yes, you may. The alternate pronunciation of cheroot is cheroot. And you say, oh, wow, I was completely wrong. And SH is kind of hard to say with a ch sound, right? So, change your plans, plan B. CH instead of SH. And now you're on a better path, because CH, you can pretty much pronounce SH and CH. Good? Yes. Awesome. So, corundum, shirut, kanji, and over there, a cool word with a V, not a C. Vetiver. It's a plant, commonly used in places like uh, perfumes or incenses and other stuff. And it's cool because you might think it has two T's, but it doesn't, it only has one. And it's an I-V-E-R. Uh, I've actually found this on the back of like shampoo bottles. It's pretty cool. Uh, vetiver. It's aromatic. It's kind of like lemongrass, but not similar stuff. So. Um, yeah, vetiver. Any other questions? No. Awesome. Turkish. So Turkish is interesting, because Turkish doesn't have much to do with other languages, in terms of, uh, you can't always trace, like, oh, this word originated here, but it does have relatively close connections with other languages, like Arabic. So, over here, Chaos. A Turkish messenger or sergeant. Uh, this one has a weird thing of having an alternate pronunciation that's chaush, 
uh, which they usually won't give you because it's just confusing. Uh, and that's one of the things, the S, because sometimes they pronounce with a shut sound, but chaps. The tricky part about this is the OW sound is an I-A-U. The rest of the OWs are usually A-U's or A-O-U's, like JOWR. So sometimes you have these weird uh, vowel combinations, so A-O-U for OW. Kind of weird, right? But the beginning is a G-I. I-A-O-U for the OW sound. Amazing. But words like Effendi, right? The Turkish part about this word is the FF for the F sound, not like an F or a PH. It's just an EFF. And the rest of it, ND, E N D I, is pretty similar. Uh, Khedive, a ruler of Egypt from 1867 to 1914, governing the viceroy of the Sultan of Turkey. Khedive, right? Does anyone have an idea of how to approach this word? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, the E sound. And the KH, you said that the H would appear in some places. Yeah. So the K sound would be a KH, not just a K. Sometimes you have a C, like Kai G. This is special. It's often KH. And then the E sound is straightforward. So is the D. And the I is the E sound. And then after that, it's VE. Kind of like the Maldives. Maldives. Khedive but it's actually Khedive. So, it's weird, but it's good. It's not super weird. And that's about most of the spelling words once you get to know them. It's fun. And then this one, kaik G. And what's the word on the right? Kaik. 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 What is that word? Hint, it's in the picture. Boat. Yeah, it's a kind of boat. So a kaik is a kind of boat. So, what is the kaik G? Yeah, what's a rower? The guy that does this thing, right? Yeah, basically. So, it's it's either a ur. So, you guys remember what a uh, eur was in French? Someone that does something, right? So, like we talked about, like Monsieur and Monsieur's. Uh Ignoring the gender ver uh, version of the two nouns, G is like either a person that does something or like a title of respect, also. Uh, and that's common throughout languages like Turkish, as well as in like Hindi and Persian and various Indian languages too. G can be a title of respect. And so, kaik is the boat. And the guy in the boat, who rows the boat, is a kaik G. The only tricky part is the kaik itself, which starts with a C for the ka sound. The A is straightforward, thankfully. But then the ik sound is an I-Q-U-E. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the J-E-E -E is a person that rows the boat once you add that onto the boat. So, kaik plus J-E-E -E is the rower of the kaik, whereas kaik is just the boat. Okay? So, it's spelled weird, but now that you've seen the word, it's not unknown anymore. Which is always a good thing, right? So you have seen this word now, and now it's not completely unknown to you. You know it, because you've studied it, and I've taught you it. Awesome. Kaik. C-A-I-Q-U-E. It's kind of weird. It's sort of like throwing words at you, but they're interesting. And so one of the interesting things is that, especially with these really weird words that you normally wouldn't encounter in like everyday language, they tend to stick in your head. So like, what was the weird boat that we saw? Hi. Exactly. Good. Good job. And more Turkish fun. Let's look at the first word, right? Kavas. The S sound is two S's. The beginning is a K-A-V. That part is, thankfully, pretty easy. But then after that, you have Nizam, which is also relatively simple. It's just Nizam, right? After that is an Imart. You may have... It's an in or a hospital. Um, no, I was thinking of something, but it was. And then, so that is an in or a hospice. The same im sound you see in liman. So a liman is a bay or an estuary at the mouth of a river, like a lagoon. And then over at the, up there, what's that word? Yeah, so it's a yardong. And it has that weird n symbol that has like a monkey tail, right? 
So that one is a sharp crested ridge carved by wind erosion, not water erosion, from soft but coherent deposits. So uh, what's the Grand Canyon made out of? It used to be a river, and now it's just rock, right? So this one is basically like clay, and instead of a river, it was a river of wind. It's like poetry all over again. Ignoring that, we have words like dolmens, right? A long robe with sleeves worn by Turks. So this kind of evokes images of like, uh, I can't remember the wizard's name, but it's not Gandalf, it's the other dude. Um, but anyway, with like, oh, the robe with the sleeves. That, the guy that he's his friend. Maybe, I can't, I can't remember. I, I just see like, when I, yeah, yeah, when I see this word, I just think of like a wizard and a wizard robe. Wait, so it's, it's maybe it's Arma. I can't, I can't remember. Is it the friend of the I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> I'm here for words, not mythology. Anyway, Japanese. So, complete ship from Turkey. How far do we travel? Yes, correct answer, a long way. Anyway, now we have food, yay, yakitori. So, does anyone want to guess what this means? Kebabs. Yeah? Kebabs, kind of. So, the literal meaning is grilled chicken. Uh, from a yaki, roasting, plus tori, bird. So, grilled chicken, except it has skewers. Uh, what about orihan? What do you think the picture is showing? Yeah? Yeah, kind of. So it's paper folded in an accordion style so that you can write in one direction and it becomes like uh, with pages, kind of. It's just not like bound pages, it's folded pages. So that's an orihan. And so on this slide you'll notice all the blue letters are ones that have the ah sound. The ah sound is either an A or an O. And you can usually figure out which one it is based on how it sounds. So take gagaku, for example, right? When you're here with gagaku, it's more of a ah, a sound, right? But when you hear orihan, it's more of an o oh sound. And it kind of takes a minute to get used to it, if you, especially if you haven't seen those words before. Some of them you may have seen, like, spell it, for example, like geta, right? Yeah, yeah they're the clogs. Uh, but it kind of makes sense. Kakeimon. So the ah sound and the ah sound, they're similar but different. First a, and then m o n. But then over here is the A sound, not the A sound. That's urushiye. Tricky because there's a Y. So urushiye, optional Y over here. They can say urushiye or urushiye. And then over here, kakiemon. Same thing, optional Y. There's just no letter Y. Okay? So this one, the rest of it, K-A-K-I, right? Kaki. Urushiye, right? Urushi. So. Let's do a fun word. Who can spell the word kimono? Good. Yay, many hands. So, let's spell the word kimono. Go ahead. Someone. Yes. K-I-M-O-N-O. Yeah. So, K-I-M-O-N-O. -O. And now, two challenge words. Let me find you the definitions and then we can go. So, the first word is kakimono. Kakimono means a picture or writing on silk or paper suitable for hanging that usually has a roller at the lower edge. Yes? Almost. So, yes, last guess. Awesome. It's a really weird word. It's tricky because it has nothing to do with a kimono. It's K-A-K-E-M-O-N-O. -O. So this is a roller with paper, right? And another tricky word. Spell makimono. A picture, pictured story or writing mounted on paper usually rolled in a scroll compared with makimono. So this is makimono. Let's try to spell this. Yeah. Almost. Yeah? Makimono. Close. So it's actually... Last guess, yeah? Yes, good. So, this one is K-A-K-E. It's like a K, just with a K. This one is M-A-K-I-M-O-N-O. -O. So, my mnemonic is that you can't make a mono, 
It has to be a ma kimono, but this is a cake mono. Fun way of remembering two words that have to do with like pictures and papyrus, uh, not papyrus, but like rice paper. Anyway, kanban, right? A manufacturing strategy where you put like pictures of parts on cards and then whenever you run out, the picture shows up and you're like, oh, we gotta order that one. Kanban, it's pretty efficient. Urushie, we talked about that. Same thing with those words, right? The a and the o and the a. The words on the slide make sense? Yes. Cool. Let's move on. The e sound. The e sound is almost always just an i. So you have words like sukiyaki, right? Like, oh, what's another word that you've seen? Uh, it has chicken at the end. Teriyaki. Yes, good, teriyaki. So, teriyaki, right? T-E-R-I-Y-A-K-I. -I. Oh, I should have asked you spell. Anyway, sukiyaki, teriyaki, they're really similar. Both of them have what at the end? Yaki, right, Y-A-K-I. And what was yaki? Meaning? Roasting. Roasting. Oh, I said roasting. Roasting. So, yakitori, right? Meant grilled chicken. Sukiyaki and teppanyaki and teriyaki all have yaki, which means grilling or roasting, right? So teppanyaki is food grilled on a large steel plate at the diner's table, and sukiyaki is this giant bowl of soup stuff made out of uh, a base of water and soy sauce and mirin and other sugar, especially sukiyaki, as contrasted with uh, another food that's more savory and not sweet. But food, yay food. Anyway, the word at the end is netsuki, which is interesting, because you don't pronounce the second U, always. You don't always pronounce it. So that's netsuki, which is interesting. But more interesting is the one over there. That is one of the uh, rare exceptions, suji. Not only is it ee -E for the E sound, it's also a G instead of a J. And you almost always have the J. So that's a really interesting special word, and it means to wash the deck of a ship. So, it's interesting. Shoji, you want to guess what it means? Yeah? Kind of. So, the shoji is specifically the paper screen that you can use it as a wall or a sliding door, and that's a shoji. But what's the word on the left? Shogi. So, this is gi, and that's G. And shogi is, does anyone know what this picture is showing? Japanese chess. So shogi is a version of Japanese chess, whereas shoji is a paper screen for a wall. It's interesting, right? And what's the difference between the two? The G and the J. And how do you pronounce each of those letters? Gi or G, right? So if it's a G, it's a J. And if it's a Gi, it's a G. Relatively straightforward. Now, the U sound and the I sound. So, has anyone seen the word uh, zaibatsu before? Probably if you've seen it spelled it or somewhere. So, a zaibatsu is a powerful financial conglomerate. It's like a big business organization. Um, whereas, banzai is a cry of enthusiasm. Uh, what's another word? Oh, I just remembered. Because Z sound, right? So, uh, what's kudzu? Does anyone know what kudzu means? Yeah? Yes, it's an invasive plant. And it was, do you know what it was originally planted for? Um, feeding Sometimes. So is it, yeah? Yeah, one of the minions said bonsai. Uh, yeah? Yeah, that part's right. So it was originally intended, Kudzu was originally intended to control like erosion. So if you have like a hill, right, and you don't want dirt to run down the hill, you would put Kudzu on it, and so the plant kind of like holds the soil on there, but then it turned into an invasive species like I mentioned. So. Kudzu, and how do you spell that? Yes, anyway. Yes, that. K U D Z U. Yay, Kudzu. Uh, so the Z sound is pretty much a Z. So you have zaibatsu, right? The I sound is an AI. So you have banzai, bonsai, zaibatsu, 
And the ooh sound is an ooh. Have you guys seen the uh, shakuhachi? Or there was a poem about the shakuhachi. I'm trying to remember what it's called. But anyway, shakuhachi. Oh, there was also a movie, but about a dog that has something to do with this. Anyway, so hachi, just hachi, yeah, because hachi means eight, and so yeah. Anyway, so a shakuhachi is a Japanese bamboo flute, uh, and then a satsuma. S-A-T-S-U-M-A, is a hard-grained Japanese pottery produced about the end of the 16th century. And then you guys have seen nunchaku, right? Yeah, nunchucks. Yes, nunchucks. So, it's kind of weird because sometimes it's giving me like nunchucks or nunchaku, but it's relatively straightforward as well, right? Yes. Yeah. And we've got some more interesting words. So, over here. Now you see the kakemono and makemono that I puzzled you so. Wait. And over there, at the right, with the same cuff sound, you have gyakuro. That's a kind of T. So gyakuro literally comes from uh, gyoku, meaning precious stone or gem, plus ro, which means dew. So that's T, right? But that's a really, really light colored T. And so it's like a precious gemstone pearl, kind of, because it's such a light T. Uh, but it's like high grade T. So it's gyakuro. Anyway. And over there, here, sometimes you have the K with two Ks, the kasa with two Ks. So like haku. So haiku is a form of haku, likewise. And then shiken, a powerful financial and industrial conglomerate of Japan. What is this kind of like? Azabasu, yeah. So related words already. But shiken has two Ks, and that's what makes it special compared to the other words. The sh is still spelled with a SH and the rest of it is still phonetic, like an I. But it's cool. And we talked about kakemono and makemono, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Any questions on this slide? No. no. Awesome. And Chinese. Yeah. So Chinese actually has nothing to do with Japanese. In theory, it should be in a, uh, there should be like a title slide of its own, because this is the Sino Tibetan branch of languages. Uh, it's completely unrelated. But anyway, so Chinese words. Uh, it's really interesting because sometimes uh, you will encounter really, really weird words, most of which I haven't put on here. Um, and so, for anyone who's, who knows Chinese or like the system of writing Chinese in English, uh, there, there used to be an old system called the Wade Guile system, uh, and it shifted to pinyin uh, relatively recently. But before the pinyin system, where it's relatively more uh, phonetic, was the Wade Guile system. And they used to do really weird stuff. Like, if you heard a J sound in Chinese, they would spell it in English with a CH, which doesn't make sense. Like, why, why would you do that? Just put a J, please. <laughs> but they put a CH. Uh, and, and so you end up with some random words like Dujun, which is T-U-C-H-U-N. But I didn't bother with those because they're awfully weird. Anyway, words that are less awfully weird, like loquat. How many of you guys have seen that sort of a plant on a tree? <laughs> uh, I, I actually saw it on quite a few trees here in Texas because it grows pretty well here in Texas and in Florida. Uh, it's kind of like a kumquat. Uh, they have similar sounds, right? How do you spell kumquat? K A M Q U A T. It 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 can be C or it can be K. So okay. commonly K U M Q U A T K U M Q U A T K. Uh, but. So kumquats are of, of the citrus variety, and loquats are not citrus variety. They're actually more closely related to like apples. Uh, yeah, interesting fun fact. Yay, horticulture. Uh, anyway, so loquat has a Q-U-A-T, right? The ah sound is just the A, usually. Sometimes it's an O, like su chong. Uh, we were talking about chong sums at the beginning. So chong sum, the weird part about that is the ah sound is E-O. So sometimes you can actually hear it pronounced more like chong song, but it's usually just chong song. So C H E O N G. Interesting part about that word. And over here you have ponji. It's a kind of uh, raw silk. It's a crew in color, which is light brown, right? What's another word for a crew? Beige. Beige. And so you have another word like sun glow. So a lot of T words, right? Because T. Uh, a lot of T's from China. So you have Suchong, that's a kind of tea. You had Gyokuro, which was a kind of Japanese tea. You have Pico, which is tea made from the first three leaves on the spray. Uh, interestingly enough, what is Ceylon? Uh, a Chinese port. Or no, it's Chinese port. Yeah, it's Chinese. So, so Ceylon was another term for Sri Lanka. 
So we were talking about Sri Lanka before. Uh, yeah, this is tea grown in Sri Lanka. It just has a Chinese word for it. Yeah? Is it chai Chinese? Yeah, so chai is, that's, that's a really interesting point. So, chai, one of the super weird phenomena all across Asia, whether you're going into like the Middle East or into the Far East, so all the way in like Korea and China and Japan, it's the same term as in like India and the Middle East is chai for tea. Uh, which is really interesting considering the languages have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with each other. But they all picked up the same word, chai, because they all loved it so much and they started trading it between like, the different countries. Cool, fun fact, okay. Uh, and then, so sunglow, right? A type of green tea, pico. This one has just an O at the end. That one has an O-E, that's why that one is special. And then lauda, the skipper of a Chinese craft. Uh, so if, if, if anyone speaks Chinese, that does come from da meaning big. Uh, they just decided to put an H at the end of it for some reason, I guess. But, now that we know that word, you know, D-A-H instead of just D-A. So, L-A-O, D-A-H. And the rest of it is relatively straightforward once you get around things like the Chong being E-O-N-G. Any other questions about these words? Okay, go into more detail. Right. Is it confusing? Does it kind of make sense? Yeah, mixed response. <laughs> so I said they'd be tricky. I hope they weren't too tricky. Uh, rather than like tofu and udon, right? Because that's too simple. Yeah? Okay, good. Gotcha. So, sun glow. It's like a sun. It's like sun glow. I, I, that's why I couldn't find a picture for it, because there are like companies that name themselves sun glow, like the glow of the sun. But it has nothing to do with you company, I'm sorry. Bad company. T. T. And then ponji, right? That's a kind of uh, silk that's got away from its original ecru state and being made into a variety of colors, especially with uh, artificial materials like rayon. But yeah, that's why it's a dress. That one is interesting. It's a keelin. So E is spelled with a Y in that word because it's special. Uh, this one is a uh, sort of dragon in, or a unicorn, sorry. More of a unicorn than a dragon. Dragon would be like long and scaly and fiery. This one has the tail of an ox and the body of a deer. Yeah. It's like a unicorn, without the horn, yeah. Uh, and then this one is renminbi. So renminbi is currency. Uh, the other definition for that is yuan, which you may have heard as the Chinese currency. Similar to, say, Japanese yen. No, same unit. Uh, renminbi does come from uh, the Chinese word part ren, which means people or person. Uh, yeah, it's people's currency. Renminbi is currency. And then pidan. Pidan is interesting. If you've ever been to like an Asian market, you may have seen this in boxes, also called like century eggs. They are uh, duck eggs preserved in brine, often for very long periods of time, like a century. Uh, yeah, and that's why they turn like black. Uh, not to be confused with. Um, oh, I just saw the other word. Ah, balut. You guys ever seen balut? So there's there's. <laughs> So there's pidan, which is uh, Chinese, and there's uh, balut, which is from the Philippines. Uh, B A L U T. It's an interesting thing. So, any question about these words? They kind of make sense? Yeah? All right. Now, Austronesian languages. So we kind of deviated even further from the this part of Asia, or this part of Asia, and went over over here to places like the Philippines and Malaysia, and then even further to the islands of Hawaii and Samoa. So, Tagalog, language of the Philippines. So you have words like Balintawak, right? Which sounds really weird, but it's like ba, and then lint, like from the dryer, and then awak, A-W-A-K. It's like you're going on a walk and you forgot the L. <laughs> so, Balintawak. The ah sound is the A over here. We were talking about uh, pansit before, the noodle dish. Not to be confused with which word? Pansit. Yes, good. And what does it mean? Uh, yeah, the Buddhism thing. Yeah. So, so noodles versus Buddhism. It's a dual. Uh, and then you have ipalipo. Ipalipo is a tropical leguminous shrub used to control various undesired grasses in pastures. So kind of like the opposite uh, effect of kutsu. Yeah, question? Uh, ah, the cards. Good, good, good. So, let us have a question time. That didn't make sense. Uh, so, someone tried to spell the word pangingi. Pangingi is a card game. 
I'm being me. Think about it. It's weird. It's tricky. That's why I didn't put it up. So, yeah. Almost. So, Pangingi. This. P A N G U I N G U E. So, not only is the E sound spelled differently two different times, first you have a U I and then you have a U E, it's also the N with a diphthong two times. Both of them is just an N G though, like penguin. It's kind of like penguin, you just took the E and replaced it with an N, oh, with an A, and then at the end you added G U E like meringue. Uh, don't worry about the, the yeah the words that I'm saying. It has nothing to do with penguins. <laughs> penguins usually don't play cards unless you're watching that movie in which they obliterated the apartment. Yeah, awesome. Mr. Popper's penguins. So pangingi, right? It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, so Pangingi is, is the weird exception, right? So Ipil Ipil pretty much follows that rule, especially because it's repetitive. So not only do you have it once, you have it twice, the I for the E sound. But then Pangingi goes and destroys your conception of that because it's weird in its own right. It's like E U I and then E U E for some reason. You just know that word, it's a fun word. Sometimes they ask it. It's also fun to know. It's like, do you know how to play Pangingi? Time what? Do you know how to play penguins? No. <laughs> Melee! So, from Malaysia. Moving on from the Philippines. So here, you have words like topeng, right? This is Japanese, it's not Malay specifically. That is a grotesque mask, that's what it's called in the dictionary. And it's a type of uh, dance, basically. So you're doing like different narrations and stuff. Uh, Trepang, can anyone guess what that is? A sea slug. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's served with a piece of asparagus, too. They were very considerate. <laughs> So, I'm sorry? I would too. I like asparagus. Asparagus is nice. Uh, and then bante. That's kind of like a cow, but also not. Uh, I was trying to find a picture for it, and they're like a bunch of pictures of just cows. And I'm like, well, hello, cow. Bante. Uh, Takeaway is the ah sound and the a ah sound are both a. So, b a n, like ben, and then teng, t e n g. Pretty straightforward, right? Ikat is like uh, a version of tie-dye, kind of, just more like, more classy. You have like these vertical designs and these horizontal designs, and it's pretty cool. And then over here, the siamang. It's a monkey that's pretty uh, distinctive. So, the siamang, it's a monkey, right? And it makes funny noises. How do you spell it? Yes, awesome. So you remember, right? <laughs> so now you can associate the sound of the CMN with the spelling of the CMN and impress your friends with the funny sounds they make, especially when you're bored. Awesome. And Maori. Has anyone seen that bird before on the right? No. It it's like the. An owl. It kind of looks like an owl. Uh, it can't fly, uh, so it kind of just like hops around and waddles around on the floor of the forest. Yeah, it has wings. Uh, it's just satisfying on the ground. Yeah? Um, it seems like a half owl, half gerbil. Yeah, kind of. So it, it kind of it, it does look like a green owl, right? Or a gerbil. It kind of walks like a gerbil, it just like pops from place to place on the ground. So, uh, back over here. Uh, here you see more of like the repetitive aspect, and Maori does borrow from uh, Hawaiian, not borrowing, but they both share a characteristic of, say, the cut sound, the cut sound being with a K in many cases. Oh, sorry. Um, so, the cut sound is with a K, right? So, kie kie, k-i-e, k-i-e. The a sound is an e sound, and the a uh sound can be various vowels. But most of the time, you can tell which one is going to be based on the word. So, kaikatia, right? Kai is weird because it's k-a-h-i. But then after that, it's just a ka, a k-a. And then tia, it's like t, but tia. And how would you spell that? Yes, good. T E A. Because you can see how it says T E A, right? <laughs> and then over here, you have a kokapoo. It's a fish. Not like the kakapo. Kokapoo? Kakapo. Kokapoo? Kakapo. So a kokapoo is a fish. And even better, kapuka. Kokapoo, kapuka, uh, kapuka. <laughs> so, so, uh, so kind of a tongue twister. Say all of them uh, twice fast. 
I didn't realize you have cockatiels too that have nothing to do with this. Kokapukapuka, kakapo, cockatiel. Alright, so a kapuka is a plant, right? A kapuka is a rather small New Zealand broadleaf evergreen tree. Kapuka. Kokapukapuka. You get the point, right? Alright. And Hawaiian. So, adding to those three, kikepa. So, Kokapu, Kapuka, Kakapu, Kikepa. Fun. Most of them are just straight vowels. Uh, by straight vowels, I mean simple vowels. So, Ki, K I, K, K E, Pa, P A, right? Not too much complication there. You have a Lokelani, which is a flower. Uh, and then you have a Hukilau, which is sort of like a sane fishing party. It's like a party, but you're fishing. Uh, so that's Huki, H-U-K-I, Lao, L-A-U. And then over there is a Iiwi. It's a bird. A Hawaiian honey creeper with chiefly bright vermilion plumage. They used to make feathers. Doesn't vermilion mean like red? Yes, it does. Good. Ooh, who wants to spell it? Oh, wow. oh I do. Yeah, go ahead. V-E-R-M-I-L-L-I-O-N. Close. Just one out. Vermilion. Okay. So it's red, just like the bird. And over here is a pahoe hoey. So pa, p a, right? Hoey. How'd you spell hoey? H o e. Exactly. H o e. H o e. Pahoe hoey. So you guys are good with the slides. Words on the slide. Yeah. Movie yeah. time. Yes, indeed. We get to watch a specimen of pahoe hoey. This is a can of. Uh, <laughs> that's a can of soup ravioli. And that's being popped by the lava. Uh, so. I want to see that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, oh, re rejected by the system. <laughs> Fun. Okay. So you guys can go watch uh, lava blowing up cans of ravioli on your own time. <laughs> but you know what to do right after that is come to the next week. And what are we going to do next week? Uh, go and be practice bee. Not yet. It's not the end yet. The end is nigh. So next week, we are going to do words from Arabic, Hebrew, and Yiddish. Ooh. Fun. Lots of fun. Okay. When are we doing this song reading? After that. Oh. So the final week. Done, done. Arabic, Hebrew, and Yiddish. We did some numbers trivia. Yiddish has 150, 200 words. Hebrew has around 600. And Arabic has 941. So, language trees. Guess what language you can't find on this tree? Uh, 